Hello, I hope that this recording can help you get started with the financial aid process at Sierra College. Here are the timestamps that if you're interested in jumping to a specific part of the video, as this video is divided into three different parts, a financial aid presentation, the creation of the FSC ID, and the completion of the FAFSA application. On the first part of the video, we'll cover a quick financial aid overview on the steps to understanding the actual financial aid process at Sierra College. My name is Brian Tolentino, again, a financial aid outreach technician at Sierra College. Here's my contact information if you need it or have any questions about the process. So what exactly is financial aid and how do you get your money? So financial aid is the money that you can get in order to pay for your college expenses. And that could be anything between tuition, books, laptops, rent, groceries, anything that basically, you know, that you need to pay for to excel in college. So financial aid can help with those expenses. In order to get financial aid, you do have to apply for it. That includes mostly if an application. So typically that would be the FAFSA or, you know, or the CADA, California Dream Act, or for scholarships, you may need to write an essay. So which application do I do? So depending on your citizenship status and, you know, if you're a dreamer or undocumented, there are two different uh, applications that students can, can apply for. So if you're a U.S. citizen, permanent resident, or an eligible non-citizen, you're eligible to do what's called the FAFSA application. This is what most students are probably familiar with. Um, it's federal and state money, so you can qualify for Pell, loans, Cal Grant, um, CCPG tuition waiver. You will need a social security number in order to create something called the FSA ID in order to do the application. However, if you're from, coming from a mixed status family where you have a social security number but your parents don't, you can still do this application, the FAFSA application. If you're a dreamer, documented or undocumented, you're eligible to do what's called the California Dream Act application. This qualifies you for state money, so a Cal Grant and the CCPG tuition waiver. You do also have to complete an AB 540 application at the college you plan to attend. However, you do not need a social security number in order to complete that application. So there's two different ones, they both do the same thing and you're only eligible to do one of them um, at a time. Either way, most students have some sort of means to apply for financial aid. And if you don't know which one you should be applying for, just ask us or ask me and see what steps you can take in order to start your financial aid process. Really quick, there is something that uh, the government looks at called your dependency status. So if you can say yes to any of the following here, so if you're over the age of 24, or if you're born before January 1st, 1999, or if you're married, or if you have kids or legal dependents, you're a veteran of the military, or you're an emancipated minor or in the guardianship or at risk of homelessness, if you can say yes to any of these, it just has to be one, you're considered what's called independent. And independent students do not need to put parent information on the FAFSA. However, if you cannot say yes to any of this, you're considered what's called dependent. And dependent students do have to provide parent information on the FAFSA. However, if you're in a situation and you feel like maybe you can't provide parent information, Come ask me questions, come talk to me, and I can help you with your situation. There's a lot of different types of financial aid, so we'll break it down a little bit. So the money that you want, that's in green. Uh, those are scholarships and grants. Typically, with scholarships and grants, you do not have to pay those back, and that's why it's kind of like on the top, it's green, you know, green for go, green for money. Um, so that's typically, assuming that you pass all your classes and you're not withdrawing from too many and you're not completely you know, withdrawing, um, you typically don't have to pay that money back and that's used to help with uh, you know, paying off you know, either the classes or maybe uh, books and materials. You know, it's that quote unquote free money from the government that people talk about, so that's the money that you want. Money that you can earn, there's also something called federal work study. Uh, just think of it as uh, on-campus employment Basically, the difference between this and like a normal job is that the federal work study program puts money away at a specific pot that you're just gonna pull from and you just work as needed. And then money you get only if you need it. So at Sierra College, we do offer loans for students, well, except you know you only get it if you need it because with loans, you do have to pay those back. So just be aware that um, you, know, you don't wanna take out loans unless you absolutely have to, okay? And that's why it's kind of like on the lower end, um, you know, red like don't get it unless you need it and then at the community college level we do offer something called tuition waivers and tuition waivers what they do they cover the cost of your classes and classes tend to be um you know for the most part uh when you're going to school tend to be probably one of the most expensive things because you're paying 46 dollars a unit so if you're in 12 units right 12 times 46 whatever that is um you're gonna have to pay for that 
We offer two different ones, the, the CCPG tuition waiver and the two years free tuition waiver. Um, they both do the same thing, uh, different requirements for both of them, and we'll actually go into detail about the two years free tuition waiver later on. Um, but just be aware of that at the California Community College level, you do um, you do qualify or do have the, the means of being able to qualify for a tuition waiver. Uh, one financial aid application applies to pretty much everything on here. So, you know, you do the FAFSA, you're going to automatically apply to everything, pretty much everything on here with just one application. And the good thing is that financial aid does stack. So if you get a tuition waiver, in addition to getting grants, cool, your, your, your enrollment costs are covered and then you can use the money that you get in, in forms of grants to pay for other things of going to college, like books, like rent like groceries, right? So, you know, it could be really helpful if, you, if, if you're able to get multiple um, financial aid awards. So that's a good thing. And you do have to apply every single year, so just be aware, just because you get something one year, um, you do have to apply next year, every single year that you're in college in order to qualify for financial aid. So for two years free, there has been a change for the 2022-2023 school year. Um, these are the requirements, and you can find this on our webpage. Um, there's a two years free, uh, page on our website. You have to complete a FAFSA or ACADA and a first-time college student admissions application by March 2nd. So March 2nd, super important. That's what you're going to, that's the date that we use in order to make sure that students can qualify for their two years free. You do have to opt in into the program by June 1st. So, you know, during that time, uh, probably around April all the way to June, just make sure that you opt in. And as you're making your decision in order to be in what school you want to go to, just make sure you opt in into the program and, and ensure that, hey, if you do end up going to Sierra, that you're going to qualify for the two years free. You do have to graduate from a local high school. So our local high schools um, will get priority. And so any of our schools coming from Placer, Rockland, Unified, Roseville, um, some Sacramento schools and some schools up in El Dorado County. There's a couple different ones. Um, the list of schools will be found on the web uh, on the website as well. Um, so if you graduate from a local high school, you will be given pretty much priority in order to get the two years free. You do have to be a California resident or AB 540 eligible. So just make sure that you know you've been in California for a while, or that you are a California resident, or you know you complete the AB 540 um, affidavit in order to maintain eligibility for two years free. And also make sure that you enroll in at least 12 units by the ad drop deadline for when you start. Um, so there is an ad drop deadline for when students enroll into classes and just make sure that you're in at least 12 units by that time. You can find where you see your two years free status in your My Sierra. So this is the homepage. It's all the way over to the right hand side of the My Sierra. When doing the FAFSA, there's a couple documents that you'll need. So I'm just going to do a quick little uh, showcase of the documents that you'll need. Um, you'll need the 2020 uh, tax tax return. So the best thing to use is the the tax return that you used when you filed taxes. It's the one that has all the boxes um, on the right, right hand side where you can sign and fill out. Um, this one is super like the most useful because uh, all of the questions on the FAFSA will refer to these specific boxes. For example, there's a question that asks about your adjusted gross income. What is the adjusted gross income? I have no clue, but they tell you to look on the 2020 and it'll say line 11 of the uh, 1040 form. So you would just have to look at this box. In addition to the 1040, you'll also, um, there's gonna be some questions regarding the W-2. Um, so I'd also make sure that you have this one as well. This next section, we'll talk about something called the FSA ID. So the FSA ID or Federal Student Aid ID, uh, what it's used is to electronically sign the FAFSA. It's used to complete the student loan paperwork. So if you decide to take out loans, there are steps you have to do on the FAFSA website in order to qualify for loans. And then it allows, allows you to log into all of the US Department of Education websites. Think of this as your FAFSA account, right? As long as you're going to be in college and applying for financial aid, um, you'll remember your FSA ID and use it every single year when you apply for financial aid. So where you want to go, you want to go ahead and start and head over to fsaid.ed.gov. Once you're there, let's go ahead and get started. You're going to go to the create an account FSA ID page, um, and then you're going to click on the get started button right here. So this is where we'll begin. If you haven't created the FSA ID before, this is where you're going to begin. You do have to provide personal identify, identification information. So you'll need um, 
what your first name, middle initial, last name is on your social security card, as well as your birthday and your social security number. So please make sure that your all of this information is exactly how it shows up on your social security card, okay? Um, Every single social security number can only be attached to one person. So as a student, you wanna make sure that your social security number is tied to your name and your birthday, okay? I also recommend that parents also create uh, a, an FSA ID because it will allow them to electronically sign the FAFSA. Um, but I'm talking in the perspective of the student, you wanna make sure that all of your information, the student is connected to your social security number, okay? So your name, your birthday, your phone number, all of that good stuff. Parents, at the same time, you can create yours as well. Just make sure that your social security number is uh, tied to your um, to your name, your uh, birthday, and your uh, your email, and all of that. So, in order to create uh, the FSID, you're going to create a username. Um, so, don't include personal information such as your birthday or name on the username. Um, if you see the message that the username is already in use, then someone has already chosen that username. Just choose something else. You know, everyone's applying for financial aid, so there's, you know, a lot of usernames that are already taken. You want to make sure that it shows that username is available. And then for a password, the password has to be between eight and thirty characters in length, and does have to contain all of the following on here. So an uppercase letter, a lowercase letter, a number, and it has to be more than eight characters. Um, so just make sure that you know your password hits all of these check marks as you're typing it out. And you want to make sure you write down your username and your password somewhere that you're going to remember. If you want to take a picture of it on your camera phone, or if you want to, you know, put it in an email and email it to yourself, or write it down in a notebook. Whatever you're going to do to make sure that you can find this information again later on, you want to make sure that uh, you have access to it. And your password is case sensitive because you do need an uppercase and a lowercase uh, letter in there. So just make sure you're writing it exactly as it is. Um, if you're alternating or putting in like you know uppercase and lowercase letters. Here you're gonna, the next page, you're gonna provide contact information. So you're gonna put in your uh, your address on here and then a contact phone number. So to sign up for a mobile phone account recovery, you can provide a mobile phone number on the screen, which is super useful. Let's say you get locked out of your account because you forgot your password, it's all good. You know, people don't remember. Uh, you can use your phone number and you know, they'll text you, um, text you and give you a, like an account recovery passcode. So always make sure that your information is correct. Any errors could result in delays um, because you'll have to go in and make sure to fix your FSA ID and everything. So really take the time to make sure that all the information on here is correct, okay? So um, definitely put a mobile phone number here if you want to set up the account recovery. So if you wanna do that, it makes it easier to unlock your account and to reset your password if that ever does happen. Let's say a year from now when you're applying for the 2023, 2024. Um, academic year. Here you'll also set up your communication preferences. So you're going to select whether you're to receive your stuff by email or by you know postal mail. Um, definitely recommend through email just because it'll go into your email and it's quick to read. Um, and you're you know you're you're not printing out uh, paper, so you're saving the trees, right? <laughs> and uh, you can also opt in to receive information uh, regarding all the different programs. And so these these ones are optional. You do have to check which uh, communications you want, but all the other informational stuff, um, you don't have to, you know, check mark if you don't want to. It's just kind of like getting in additional um, information. Of course, I would always recommend just talk to the financial aid office of the school you're going to to get the most uh, updated information kind of regarding your financial aid and what you can qualify for at those schools. And then you also have the option of um, choosing a preferred language on the bottom on here. The next thing that you'll have to do is to create uh, challenge questions and answers. Um, this is super important because uh, if you're locked out of your account, you want to make sure. Uh, another security measure is having to answer challenge questions. Um, for example, if you don't uh, choose the uh, mobile phone account recovery, you're going to have to answer the questions. So you want to make sure that you're setting up questions that one that you would remember but two that aren't super obvious so just make sure that the challenge questions are things that you would know but not everyone around you would know you know so um you do have to set up all these challenge questions in case for some reason you get locked out of your account and the answer is not case sensitive but with this and the same thing with your id and your password i definitely recommend 
um, you know, if you want to click show answer and then take a screenshot or take a picture or write this down somewhere so that we have access to it later, this will be very helpful for you later on in case you do get locked out of your account. Um, because for the most part, the financial aid office, we really can't do anything regarding your FSC ID um, because it's not really within our system. So this is where you'll have to go in and make sure that you remember all of your challenge questions and the answers to those challenge questions, okay? Because the most that we can do is try to help you, but we don't know, uh, you know the answers to these questions and we don't have the means of accessing that. The next thing you're going to do is just uh, reviewing your information and agreeing to the terms and conditions. Um, so just make sure double, triple, quadruple check everything on here. You want to make sure, again, your name is correct and it matches exactly how it shows up on your social security card, right? If you have a hyphenated last name, make sure you put the hyphen. If you have two last names, make sure, and there's a space in between, make sure you have that space in between the two last names. Make sure your date of birth is the same. I'm, I'm pretty positive because we're in the US, it goes month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. Um, so just make sure that it's correct, right? And then uh, make sure your social security number is also correct. You can always double check, click on the little edit button um, to go back to that information. And then you'll be able to see uh, you know, your social, secu social security number. The first part is super important. And then just double checking your username is good and it's going to an email address that you can use. Something that I forgot to mention, definitely make sure you're not using a high school given email, okay? If you're coming straight out of high school, do not use the high school email because you won't be able to access that after you graduate. And you won't be able to receive that information and you're gonna have to go through this whole process and it's gonna delay all of your financial aid because you have to f get access again to your account in case you get locked out, right? So make sure you're using a personal email address. Um, set up your phone and contact information and communication preferences on here, okay? So just make sure that you're reviewing everything and then accepting the terms. You'll wanna verify your account information here and next. So what's gonna happen is that you're gonna have to verify at least one sort means of communication. Um, so only a verified email address or a verified phone number is required, but if you did provide both, you have to verify both. So if you did put in a mobile phone number and an email address, you do need to verify both. So um, You'll want to make sure that you click on them and then verify the information um, or verify the number that you put and the email address that you put so once you click on either one of those i'm going to show an example of what it looks like so um, let's say you click on the phone number one they will send you a text message um, and the code and it's going to give you a six digit code um, that's only good for about 30 minutes i anticipate that with everyone kind of depending on when you're watching this it might take you know, it could be instantaneous, or maybe if you're attending one of these uh, FAFSA workshops, or if you're going, you know, sometime in October, it might take a couple minutes. So just be patient. Um, they're gonna send you a code, and it'll look like this. Just make sure that you, you know, you type out the the six digit code that they give you, and you're just gonna put the secure code here. So before you can even get through the end of the FSA ID, you do have to verify your phone number. If for some reason it's not sending to you um i say just be patient and if for some reason you're not getting any phone numbers i would say just stop right here try again the next day or try again over the weekend preferably maybe when it's not super busy you might have to go through the process again but at least at that point um maybe you know it won't be as busy and maybe you'll get the code because there are some instances where uh some nights it might take forever to get the the mobile phone number just because um there's a lot of people applying at the same time. And then same thing for the email. Um, same exact process, except that'll send it to your email. Uh, I apologize, it is kind of tiny here, but then you should see that there's going to be a six digit code in the body of the email. Um, same thing, uh, if, if all you're looking for is a six digit code, you'll find it and then you're just going to put it into the uh, secure code box as well. So it's the same thing as the number, you do have to verify it before you can continue there. And then so once you're completed with that, that's great. Keep all this information, make sure that you have it someplace that you can, uh, you know, that you're able to uh, refer to it later on. So you can go ahead and use this FSC ID and the password or the a phone number or the email uh, to go ahead and start the FAFSA application, okay? It'll take a few days to verify your social security information and that's fine, but um, you can still, apply and do the FAFSA right then and there as soon as you create your account. 
this next part of the video will actually go through the FAFSA application. Let's go ahead and go to fafsa.ed.gov. Once you go here and you click enter, you'll be taken, it should change, but then it should bring you to this, uh, the page that I was just on, where it gives you the complete the FAFSA form and uh, financial aid um, buttons here to either start here if you're new or to click that if you're a returning user. Um, assuming that most of the students that are watching this are probably coming straight out of high school, let's click on the start here button. So once you click on start here, it will actually bring you to uh, this section where it will start and it'll you'll ask, it'll ask you like, who are you and you know, if you're the student or the parent or a preparer. Um, again, this whole perspective of the video is as if I am a senior at a high school applying to go uh, for financial aid from when I start my freshman year of college um, in the upcoming year. So I'm gonna put that I am the student and I want access to the FAFSA form, so I'm gonna click on that. Here you have the option to either log in or continue or to create an FCID. If you're just getting to this part of the video, um, please refer back to some of the other uh, FCID how-to section or another video. Um, but I'm gonna click on login to continue for our, um, for our part of this video. So you're gonna log in here either using the username, the uh, email address or the mobile phone number that you used. So here as my demo, I'm gonna um, go ahead and do this. And then you're gonna click on log in here. Um, this is just something that you wanna read and accept before you begin. Um, so just letting you know that you're on a US federal government, uh, you know, website and all of that good stuff. So go ahead and just click on accept. And it might take a while to log in. There's a lot of people applying and, um, you know, doing the FAFSA application. So here, uh, we're going to go ahead and do the 2022, 2023 FAFSA application. So if you're new, um, I think the only thing you can click on is uh, start a new FAFSA. Um, if you're a returning student who's watching this video, um, then you can also do the renew my FAFSA form, which I definitely recommend because it'll pull all of the information from your previous FAFSA. Um, but um, if you're a new student, you're just going to click on the start a new FAFSA form. I'm going to click on a start new FAFSA form um, because again, I'm, I'm a senior at a high school, so I probably don't have a FAFSA um, from previous years. So let's click on start a new FAFSA form here. You're gonna create a save key. So a save key is just a temporary uh, like password, I guess. Like if you don't finish the FAFSA in one go, um, you're gonna to have to use the save, save key to get back in into the FAFSA. So the quickest thing or the most easiest thing for me, I just say use the last four of your phone number because um, that's something you should know. And then uh, you will go ahead and um, you know, just put that, you can write it down if you want to, but um, again, it's only if you don't finish the FAFSA in one sitting, uh, you'll just need the save key to come back. Go ahead and click continue. Then here, this is just uh, extra frequently asked questions about, um, you know, the FAFSA and everything. So if you want to read this, you can, or if you have any questions, just reach out to me or reach out to the financial aid office and we'll be able to answer any questions you may have about the FAFSA application. Go ahead and click continue. So here you're gonna start with the uh, personal information. Um, it should have pulled in using the FSA ID. Um, it should have pulled in your social security number and your name. Um, again, you wanna make sure that your last name on here matches exactly how it shows up on your social security card, okay? So if you have two last names and there's a space in between them, you wanna make sure that you're putting the space um, between the two last names and that you're typing as much as you can within the uh, in the box. If it somehow it doesn't fit everything, just put as much as you can on the application, okay? And if you do have any questions as you're going through this, uh, the awesome thing about this website, there's these little question mark uh, toolbars or toolboxes or whatever, like little help bubbles. You click on it and it'll uh, prompt some information to pop up. That'll hopefully answer um, your question regarding, uh, you know, the the part that you're on so if, if you if you want to go ahead and click on those if you need additional assistance you can go ahead and click on them just double check that all the information here is correct then go ahead and click on continue here you're going to double check that your email address is uh, correct as well as a phone number if you want to put in your phone number here i'm just going to go ahead and put my uh, you know a random assortment of numbers um, so go ahead and put your information on here 
go ahead and click continue. You want to make sure that your street address is correct as well. Um, there's some populated information on here, but I'm going to go ahead and change it for specifically the CR College uh, address. And then we are in Rockland in the states of California. And I believe the zip code is 95670, I think. Once all of that is completed, go ahead and click on continue. And then here it's going to ask about your residency. So if you've lived in California your whole life and you've been here for the past five years, you're going to go ahead and click on yes. If you haven't, and let's say you moved in California in about 2018, that's perfectly okay. You're going to click no. And then it's going to ask your legal state of residence. So if it's still California because you've been here, um, it's going to ask when you became a legal resident. So as you can see here, depending on how you answer the questions, new questions will pop up. So if you're still, you know, a legal California uh, you're a California resident or your legal residence is in California. Um, you just want to make sure that you're answering this. If you, you know, became a legal resident of California before 2017, cool. You just put yes. Or if, if it wasn't, you came here, you know, in uh, June of 2018, you can put that as well. So it, it, the answers and the questions will, will, the questions will populate as you answer them. For our purposes, I'm just going to answer that I have been in California for the last five years. And then you're going to answer if you're a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen or neither. Um, for in this case, I'm going to put that I am a U.S. citizen. Um, eligible non-citizens, those are um, individuals with, an, I, I believe it's a USICS number or an alien registration number. Um, if you have a permanent resident card, um, I believe those are... Uh, those students that uh, qualify for eligible non-citizenship. If you are neither a citizen or eligible non-citizen, you may qualify to apply for the California Dream Act. Uh, reach out to me and I can help you um, get to those workshops and those videos as well. And for the purposes of this uh, recording, I'm going to answer as a US citizen. Go ahead and click continue when you're done. For student education, here you're gonna answer what your high school completion status be when you um, begin college. So assuming that you're a senior right now and you're gonna start in the fall of 2022, um, just put that you're gonna have either high school diploma, maybe GED um, or homeschooled. Uh, I'm gonna put high school diploma. And then the type of degree that you're gonna be working on when you start college. Uh, typically most students are either working towards their first bachelor's degree or you know if you're going to Sierra College, technically you're working towards an associates. Um, what I would recommend doing if you know that you're going to transfer out to a, uh, a four year inst institution after being at Sierra, I would just put first bachelor's degree, either that one or the associate's degree for general education or transfer. That's also good. Um, so I'll just put first, ba first bachelor's degree. And then here, will you have your first bachelor's degree before you begin? Probably not, especially if you're, you know, just starting a college, you're most likely not going to have it. The bachelor's degree are the four year degrees that you get at a college. And then what's your college grade level? Um, if you took academic enrichment or dual enrollment courses, um, maybe you want to put that you attended college before. If you're a returning student, you know, just kind of put the equivalence of how many units you've taken. Or if you're a high school student that never took college credits, um, either way, uh, probably one of these two are going to be a good answer. Unless you're like a returning student who's been at Sierra for, you know, for a year already, or maybe a few years, then you can answer as such. For this purpose, I'm going to put... Um, never attended college. And then if you're interested in work study, so again, if uh, if you're watching from the beginning, uh, work study basically on campus employment. Um, if you answer yes, it's just asking if you're interested. This isn't gonna automatically put you into work study. There is a process you have to go through in order to to, to be in it. Um, if you put yes, it'll just send you information and, and sign you up to, to be in uh, work study. If you don't want to, that's fine. Or you can click don't know, it's really up to you. Um, I would just put yes or don't know just so you don't disqualify yourself from work study in case you just want to have the option. Um, I'd recommend just putting either one of those. And then the next question is going to ask about selective service. So if you're a male or you're a born male, um, technically speaking, that uh, by law you do have to register for selective service, um, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't your registration status does not affect your eligibility for um, federal student aid so you know um, select service isn't required for getting fi uh, federal financial aid 
So um, if you're not registered, that's okay in terms of uh, getting financial aid. Um, you don't have to be registered for civil service, although you technically, if you're an able-bodied male over the age of 18 to 25, uh, you do have to register. Um, so if, if you are or if you don't know, you can click no and then have the FAFSA register you for civil service. And that way, you know, you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you answer female, if you're a born female, then you click that, it doesn't populate the other uh, questions. But if you're an able-bodied male who's going to be 18 or any anywhere from 18 to 25, then you do have to um, answer the selective service question. Again, your selective service registration does not affect your eligibility for federal student aid. Click next or continue. Here you can put your driver's license number if you have one. Um, you can you know grab it and then just kind of put the information on here. And then I'll put California because you know I got my driver's license in California. Go ahead and click continue. Here it's going to ask about uh, foster care and your parent education level. So if you're in foster uh, foster care at any time, you'll answer accordingly. And then um, what is the highest uh, school completed by your biological parents? Okay. So when it asks about parents, it's typically asking about biological parents. But when we get to the parent demographic section. Um, I'll kind of break down like who you're supposed to put on the FAFSA regarding parents, okay? So here, let's just put that and this one and then click continue. So here you're gonna add your high school, um, you know, just choose, uh, you know, your your state or maybe you're, uh, you know, you're coming from like a, a foreign country. Um, they have a bunch of different options here. Um, for the purposes of recording this video, I'm just gonna go ahead and put in Rockland High School just cause you know, live in Rockland, um, or it's your college is stationed in Rockland, I mean, Rockland High School. You're going to click on search, and then it'll show up the different high schools uh, in Rockland, California. You can see here there's a bunch of different ones. Um, Rockland High is right here, so I'm just going to click on the little button right there, and then uh, scroll down and hit continue. Then it's going to ask you to double check. You come from Rockland High, yeah, it's in Rockland and it's in California. Once you can confirm that information, go ahead and click on continue. And then here you're going to put in all of the colleges that you're considering or even have a thought of like as a backup. Um, you're limited up to 10 colleges uh, at the first time you submit your FAFSA. So if you're applying to all of the CSUs and all the UCs, you just want to make sure that as you're going through the FAFSA, do the first 10 and then uh, come back later and add the, n the next ones and then until you have applied to every single school. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put Sierra College first here. So the main campus for Sierra College is in Rockland, so that's why I put Rockland here. Even if you're going to the NCC campus, the Tahoe Truckee or the Roseville Centers, um, at least on the FAFSA, it'll be underneath Rockland. So here you're going to look. Um, the federal school code for Sierra College is this right here, 001290. I know that this is uh, the correct one because um, Sierra College in Rockland, California. I'm going to go ahead and click the little checkbox. And now you see it tells us that we have one out of the 10 schools. Um, the next school that I'm going to put is Sacramento State. So I'm just going to put Sacramento State. It's in uh, Sacramento. I'm going to go ahead and put search. And here it's going to show all the different Sacramento schools. Um, Sacramento State is also known as California State University Sacramento. Um, and so I know that it's this one. I'm going to click on the little checkbox here. And then I'm also going to put UC Davis. So Davis is located in Davis. So UC Davis. Click search. And then it is UC stands for University of California. So it is this one. So go ahead and click the little checkbox. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put one out of state school in here. Um, a lot of the students uh, that I've worked with, they like going to University of Nevada, Reno. So I'm just gonna put Reno, and then I can even type in UNR because I know it's University of Nevada, Reno. Click search, and then it should populate here. Yeah, so University of Nevada, Reno is right here. And I'm gonna click the little checkbox. Once you have all the schools or you're maxed out at your 10, and we're gonna go ahead and click on continue here. And then here um, is just, uh, I'm going to let you know now the order doesn't really matter. 
I recommend just making sure that you always include a California school so the so you automatically apply for stuff like the Cal Grant and additional state funding. Um, just make sure you have a California school on here if you're you know if you're watching this and you're coming from in a, in a California school. Um, but the order really doesn't matter. Um, unless you want to put like what the school that you really want to go to first, if you want to do that, feel free to, um, but just letting you know now, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you do want to make sure that you choose a housing plan. Um, you know, you're letting them know, letting the school know, like how you plan to, to house yourself. Like if you're like, for example, if you're in Davis and you're going to live on campus, do that. But maybe, maybe if you're going to see our college, you're going to live with a parent. Maybe at Sac State, you're going to live at a, you know, off campus and live in apartments near the campus. And then University of Nevada Reno, maybe also um, on campus. So um, just make sure you're answering the housing plans on here. And then if you didn't put in all 10 schools, you can add more later on. Go ahead and click on continue. And then so this is uh, the student marital status. The important thing here is you want to make sure you're reading it and uh, answering as such. So this says student marital status, OK? If it's referring to the student, it'll say student. If it's referring to parent, it'll say parent, OK? So what's your marital status as of today? I'm going to put single and then click continue. And then so this is where all of those dependency questions come into play. So this first question is asking if you if you have now or if you will have kids who is going to receive more than half of their support from you. So anywhere between July 1st, 2022 and June 30, 2023, if you are going to have kids that you're going to be providing for. Um, if not, you're gonna click no. And then other dependents. So legal dependents who you take care of and provide their support, if that's gonna, if, if you provide for someone from now until June 30, 2023, um, either yes or no, probably not, so click no. Go ahead and click continue. And then additional dependency questions regarding active duty or veterans, or um, if you're in foster care, ward of court, um, emancipated minor, or legal guardianship, if you're in any of those situations, you want to click the appropriate one, right? Um, if multiple of them apply to you, you can do that. But if none of them apply, just click on none of the above and click continue. Here it's going to ask for homelessness uh, question. It's going to ask a homelessness question. So if you were homeless at the, at the time of doing this, um, on or after July 1st, so if you're at the moment that you're watching this and you are homeless, you can answer yes. Or I mean, at any time after July 1st of 2021, you just click yes. Or if not, just click no. Go ahead and click uh, continue when you're done with that one. And then here, it'll tell you what exactly your status is. So because we answered no to pretty much all of those questions and our marital status is single, um, you're considered dependent. So remember that dependent students have to include parent information on the FAFSA, okay? So you will have to include parent information on the FAFSA in order for it to be a valid FAFSA. If you're unable to provide information about your parents, come talk to me, email me, reach out, and we'll see what kind of situation and uh, you have and what steps we can take. But if you're a dependent student, you do have to provide parent information on the FAFSA, okay? Um, if you get the independent one, then you don't have to include parent information. Independent students do not have to include parents on their FAFSA. We'll click continue. So here it's gonna tell you kind of like the differences here. So if your parents live together and they're married or unmarried, you're gonna put both of your biological parents in the parent sections, okay? So if your parents live together in the same household and they're married or they're unmarried, you're gonna put both of them. If your parents are divorced and you live with one parent more than the other, so let's say you live with dad more than you live with mom for the past year, um, you're gonna put that parent, you're gonna put the parent that you live with the most on the FAFSA, okay? So if you've lived with dad for the past 12 months and you don't live with mom, you're gonna put dad's information on the FAFSA, okay? And a lot of this does, you know, for the most part, it is referring to biological parents, um, but there are different situations. And then here, if your parents are divorced or separated and you live with both of them equally, then you're gonna wanna put the parent that provides uh, more financial support for you for the past 12 months. So if you live with mom and dad equally, um, but dad provides more financial support, then you would pick, uh, then you would uh, put dad's information on the FAFSA. Or if mom makes more money and she provides for you um, and she provides more financial support for you, then you put mom's information on the FAFSA, okay? And if you're legally adopted, then you're gonna put the information about the um, um, your parents that have adopted you. So if your parents got remarried 
then you're going to have to put in, um, let's say you're living with dad and dad got remarried, then you're going to have to put dad and stepmom's information. Okay. So it's really, it's kind of confusing because it does refer to biological parents, but if your parents got remarried and the parent that you're staying with more got remarried, you're going to put that parent and then the step parent. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out and let me know. Um, but yeah, so all the information here is uh, you can click on them and see uh, whose information you're going to put on the FAFSA. Click continue when you're done. And then here it's going to ask for your parents' marital status. So here this is where you're going to answer, um, you know, parent information. So what is the marital status of your parents if they're never married or if they got married or remarried or if they're unmarried and living together. Um, just for this case, I'm going to put that my parents were married, that they were married in, I don't know, uh august um 1988 i don't know so uh, best guess on when your parents got married um so once you answer that go ahead and put continue and then here you're gonna put the information of, of the first parent so um you know just make sure that the first parent is the same like you're always referring to the first parent as parent one um so if you put mom's information first then she's parent one and then you put dad's information as parent two just make sure you're keeping that consistent so for example here, I'm just gonna put um, social security number, last name, app, uh, M for mom, mom was born. I don't know, let's give her a birth date of uh, April uh, 15th, uh, 1955, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and then mom's email address, mom's email at email.org. This is a fake email, so. so just put that. You want to make sure that your parents' email is a real one, obviously. Sorry, I didn't mean that one, but um, make sure that your parents' uh, email is correct on here. It's a legitimate one. And then uh, go ahead and click continue. And then you put the second parent. If your parents don't have a social security number, that's perfectly okay. So as long as you, the student, you have a social security number, you can apply for the FAFSA. Your parents do not need a social security number in order to be on the FAFSA. If your parents don't have a social security number, just put all zeros. And I'll do show SSN. You can put all zeros on here and that's perfectly okay. And then F for father. And then uh, dad was born. Let's give him a November 22nd, uh, um 1960 birthday so put in all that information and then click continue and then it's going to ask the same uh state of residence question so if your parents been in california for the past five years click yes if no just answer as you did when you answered the legal residence question um, and it'll adjust as needed for this case i'm going to put that they've been in california for the past five years go ahead and click continue then here it's going to ask for other dependents. So the first question is, how many other dependent children do your parents have? So how many siblings do you have? Um, typically, it's, uh, you know, any, I mean, I'm assuming your, your brothers and sisters live with you and in the household, you would put them on here or any, um, any other of your siblings that your parents provide more than of their financial support between this time frame. So, for example, if you, ha if you have uh, two other siblings, you're going to put two here. And then this next question is how many other dependents? So let's say grandma lives with you or maybe, you know, uncle lives with you and your parents provide for them, you can include them on here. So if let's say grandma lives with you, you're going to put one. And then go ahead and click continue. So it'll tell you what your household size is. So, you know, it's you, your parents. So that's three. Um, your two siblings. So that's five. And then um, the other dependent, which is grandma, which is six. So just make sure that it you're thinking about like who lives in the household that your parents provide more than half of their financial support. Okay, you want to make sure you're including whoever is in the household that your parents provide for. Okay, the number in college you cannot include your parents on here, but you have to make sure you include yourself plus any of your other siblings that are in college. Um, so you know if you and the other two of your siblings are going to college, then you would put three. And then that's the number in college. Um, if it's just you, you're going to put one, but you cannot put zero. You just want to make sure that you're always including yourself in the house uh, in the number in, number in college section. But for here, I'm going to put three. Go ahead and click on continue. 
So here, um, this is where it kind of gets a little bit confusing um, just regarding kind of the taxes and the financial information. Um, but I'm here to help and I have these, uh, you know, these pages here ready for us to look at. So it's gonna ask what uh, if they've completed their tax return. Um, you know, if they did, so if they did, go ahead and click on already completed. And then um, most people have done uh, IRS form 1040. If you're coming from a mixed status household, meaning that your parents don't have social security numbers, that's fine. Just go ahead and make sure you put foreign tax return, okay? So this is for the parents. Again, if your parents don't have socials, that's perfectly okay. Just make sure you put foreign tax return for that for this question, okay? Everyone else, go ahead and put IRS form 1040. And then it's gonna ask what your parents' tax filing status is according to the tax return. You can find that if you go on the 1040, this little top box right here. So let's say that your parents are married filing jointly. This is probably gonna be checked. So we're gonna put that and answer it as married filing joint. You do have the option of doing what's called the IRS data retrieval tool. It's gonna to pull in all of the information on your uh, parents' tax forms and it'll make the process so much, so much easier and uh, it'll make the process even faster. Um, just for this process, I'm gonna go in and manually put in everything, but I would definitely recommend doing the IRS data retrieval tool, okay? Um, but I'm gonna skip that and complete it manually just for the purposes of this video. And then it's just gonna say, hey, it's faster and easier. I'm just gonna say no thanks and go to the next one. So here it's gonna ask for the adjusted gross income um, and it's gonna tell you where to look for it. So it says IRS form 1040, line 11. So if you go to the 1040 form, this is what it looks like. You're just gonna go and look and say, oh, line 11. Oh, here we go. So whatever this, the whatever is in the amount right here. So um, obviously this is blank, but um, if on here you have an adjusted gross income amount of let's say like 60,000, you're probably gonna have that in here. So let's just put whatever we see in box 11 we're gonna put that here and then click continue. This question is just asking how much did each of your parents work? Um, so let's say, you know, cause mom is parent one. If mom worked and she made, you know, 45,000 and then dad worked and he only made 15,000, um, whatever the split is, best guess here, um, just best guess on whatever uh, mom and dad um, put on here. So just uh, best guess on that. Once you have that, go ahead and click continue. Then here it's gonna ask for the income tax for 2020. So just be aware that some of these uh, questions, you do have to do a little bit of math. So here it's gonna say uh, IRS form 1040 line 22 minus schedule two line two. So if we go here and we go to line 22, we're gonna see this amount. And let's say if it's zero on here already, just put zero, you don't have to do anything else. But let's say um, you know it's $100 and then you go to the schedule two line two and then you see um, that this is sixty dollars so 100 minus 60 is going to be 40. so that's the amount that we're going to put on here okay if it ends up being negative just put a zero um, so just something to be aware of sometimes some families don't file schedule one schedule two schedule three it kind of depends on how you filed your taxes and you know if you needed to so if you don't have a schedule two that's perfectly okay if you don't have a schedule one schedule three that's perfectly okay every single person who files taxes is gonna be different. So if you don't have these, don't worry about it. Not everyone has the schedules. Everyone should have a 1040 form, but if you don't have the schedules, that's perfectly okay. So once we're done here, go ahead and click continue. And then here it's gonna be other specific questions. So combat pay. Um, so this is typically, you know, if, if your parents are in the military and then maybe they get combat pay. Um, if they're not, and this doesn't apply to you, just put zero. And then other grants and scholarships. Um, reported to the IRS and your parents' in uh, income, um, you would put that information here. And if you want more information, again, click on the little uh, question mark and it'll tell you specifically um, what you have to include um, on these um, on these questions, right? So typically a lot of it is like AmeriCorps information. Um, but yeah, if, if uh, you have a college grant and scholarship aid that was reported to the IRS for your parents' income, you would include it here. Um, if you have any other education credits, here again, it tells you 1040 uh, schedule three, line three. If you don't have a schedule three, just leave it as zero. If you go to your schedule three and you see it as blank, cool, just put zero. And then um, other information here, you're gonna have to look at the IRS 1040 form and add 
some you know some different boxes here so 4a and 5a and then you had to subtract from 4b 5b so just kind of read through it and, and do the math if, it, if these are empty and you don't see anything then just treat all empty boxes as zero so just leave it as zero and then you know if you didn't file a schedule one then you don't have a schedule one that's fine leave it as zero and then if you don't see anything in line 2a then put it as zero as well then here it's saying uh, child support that your parents paid because of a divorce or separation. Um, if child support doesn't apply here, just leave it as zero. Um, cooperative education program offered by a college. If you have no idea and you never did that and it's your first time in college, it's probably going to be zero. And then other need-based employment programs like federal work study and all that. Again, if you're a first-time college student, this is all probably going to be zero just because you're. this will be the first time you're applying for financial aid. So... For most students probably watching this video who are coming in from uh, high school, it's probably going to be zero. Go ahead and click continue. And then here, child support received um, for all children. So, you know, again, if any money that your parents, uh, the parent that you're living with that received, um, again, if child support doesn't apply to you, zero. Um, housing, food, living allowances paid by military or clergy, um, you include that on here tax deferred pensions this is where you would look at the w-2 um, so you look at the uh, boxes 12a to 12d and look for any of these letters here um, so if you go to the w-2 and you look at these boxes 12a 12b um, anything that shows up uh, letter d e f g h or s um, i think the letter will be on this left hand side um, if it's empty cool uh, just put it as zero but if you see anything else here uh, you would include that amount. Uh, veterans non education but veterans non education benefits such as disability, uh, death pension, all of that you would put here. If it doesn't apply to you, put zero. And then other untaxed income such as disability benefits, workers' compensation, um, put zero. It doesn't apply to you. So when I say if it doesn't apply to you, I mean does it apply to your parents? I I apologize. So if if your parents aren't veterans, this is probably going to be zero so remember that this is parent information you're always double checking that this you're answering as the parent okay i apologize um these should be applying to your parents then click continue once you're done here and then here it's going to ask for parent assets so it's asking you know if, with your parents um you know what what's in their bank account plus uh if they have any other um investments or any other things uh, if you're looking at what exactly are assets, um, assets are typically like the the cash in their bank accounts. In addition to that, uh, businesses and other investments. Um, investments don't include retirement plans, so you wouldn't put uh, put that on here. But typically, like other um, investments, um, and their business and their uh, money and their um, checking accounts and savings accounts. Um, if it does exceed that, you click yes. And you would just answer as such. Let's say your parents have saved up, you know, six thousand, um, but they don't have uh, investments or they don't have a business or investment farm. Um, you would put zeros on here. Um, so this question kind of depends on like you know how you answer the first ones. If this one comes up, cool. If it doesn't, you probably it's probably going to ask you if you want to answer about your parents' uh, assets. I would always put in your parents' assets just because. Um, it's, it's, it's always a question that might uh, affect your FAFSA, so I'd always just make sure you're answering the assets question. Because um, there, there might be a case where it asks if you want to ask, uh, put them on here, I would say yes. And then on here, uh, depending on your, your, your parent situation, if, they, if it does exceed that, you want to make sure that you, you list it here. Um, so I'm going to do that and click continue. And then now it's for student financials. So students... Um, this is in your perspective if you filed taxes or maybe if you did or didn't work. So if you didn't work in 2020, uh, you know, 2020 was a rough year. Um, so totally understandable if you didn't work, uh, you can put that you're not going to file. Um, so that's fine. Uh, click continue. And then, you know, if you didn't work, you earned zero in wages. So click continue. And then it's going to ask the same exact questions as it did from your parents but just remember that it's in your perspective now okay so any child support that you paid so you the student did you pay child support probably not so put zero and then all these other things in here same exact questions same exact things um except this in your the student's pr perspective now um these are all probably going to be zero click continue 
and then child support received or housing food or living allowances given from the military um again if you're not a veteran uh this doesn't apply to you so just put zero and so just be aware you read through all the questions and just answer as needed um once you're done here go ahead and click continue and then here it's going to ask about your assets um i would answer this as if in your bank account include whatever is not um saved up for college so let's say if you went on amazon right now and wanted to buy stuff how much money do you have set aside that you can just buy stuff with right if you told me that you have you know like 200 dollars to your name you have 200 dollars to your name um here you have uh it's asking for your investments um so you know if you the student if you have like let's say rental property that you rent out to other people you would put that here but you probably you know maybe not so put zero here and then uh, businesses or investment farms uh, for here you're not supposed to put any businesses with less than 100 full-time employees um, so you know just put zero on here most people put zero in this one um, just because it doesn't apply to them once you're done here go ahead and click continue And then here, um, it's just asking for me for verification because it's um, it's saying that stuff is different from last year, but this is just a demo site. You're probably not gonna get this, but if you do get an error page, you just double check that all the information looks correct. Um, for me, I'm like, yeah, there is six people in the household. I'm just gonna click check for errors. And then I think it's also gonna ask about number in college. Yeah, so I'm just gonna say, yeah, there is three in college. Go ahead and click for check for errors again. Uh, for most of you, it'll probably go straight to this FAFSA summary page. So the important thing here, you just want to double check that all the information looks correct. First name, last name looks good. Date of birth is correct. Um, social security number, if you want to double check that. Make sure that um, you know, you're know you answering correctly on your grade level, your type of degree. Um, making sure you put the correct high school and all the colleges that you, even if you're thinking about it, like as a backup school, I would de definitely recommend just putting it on here just in case. Um, just go and put in, you know, double checking that you have all the colleges that you want to make sure um, that get your FAFSA. So just don't go through, double check everything, that everything looks good. And then once you're done, scroll all the way down and click continue. Then here, this is where we're going to sign and submit so just double check you want to make sure you read everything and say um that you know add that you're since you're electronically signing this that you you know that everything on here is is true and to the best of your knowledge that it is accurate right so once you're done click just click the checkbox and that you agree with everything and click sign this fafsa form and then your parent will also need to sign the fafsa okay so you will click on provide parent signature here and then um, your parent will click on this and just read everything. It's the same stuff, you know, that you certify that everything is accurate. Go ahead and click continue. So if your parents have the FSC ID, they can log in right here. Or if they did the IRS data retrieval tool, they should probably already be signed in. And then they can sign and submit. Um, if your parents are, um, you know, they couldn't create an FSC ID because they don't have a social security number, that's perfectly okay. And we're going to click on the other options to sign and submit. So if your parents have the FSC ID, they can sign electronically, but it's okay if they don't, it's all good. Just click on other options to sign and submit. And then um, you're gonna, most of you can probably do a uh, print a signature page. So when you click on this, you can print a signature page here and it'll, um, you just have to print it, um, click this and um, you just print all of this out um, and then you have your parent physically sign this and date it. Um, and then you want to make sure that you bring it to uh, the the school that you plan to attend to. Or if you want to send it to all of the different schools, you can. Um, let's say you're going to Sierra. Just bring this over to the Sierra College uh, Financial Aid Office. And we can actually uh, clear the signature for you. So if you want to, just bring it over to us. We can clear that for you. And then um, once you're done, just go ahead and click finish. And then so... Um, so if it's signed or if you have a signature page printed, then you're going to bring it to us. That's perfectly okay. You're going to go ahead and click on submit my FAFSA form now. And then you're going to get a con congratulations page. So um, congrats if you made it this far. Uh, the awesome thing is, um, you know, it'll take a couple days. Um, well, at the time, if you're watching this in October, it'll, you know, give it a few months and um, maybe you'll have back from all of the schools. 
Uh, typically around um, maybe February or March is kind of when they send, uh, you know, the financial aid packages to students. So um, as long as you're done here and everything's good, um, once you figure out what school you want to attend, definitely follow up with the financial aid uh, office um, of the school that you plan to go to to double check that one that your FAFSA got connected to your um, to your application and that, you know, everything is clear. As the next steps, I would definitely recommend just reaching out to the financial aid office for any sort of questions that you may have and just double checking that your FAFSA was completed correctly and that there are no issues. Um, if you made it this far, I appreciate you and watching all of this and um, congrats and have a successful academic year. Thank you.